All right, we've got Brad Chester and Douchey McGee, Greg Sparks here on how to deploy everything from deploying terrain, fortifications to psychic powers. In your packet at Adepticon 2013, you will get a handy dandy piece of paper that will list 1 through 10 the order of events that you're supposed to be going to today. Today I'm going to be playing Greg, he's going to be playing Eldar, I'm going to be playing my Grey Knights. After we give each other our rosters, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and identify each piece of terrain before we start placing anything on the board, including fortifications. So, we've agreed that these are two pieces of ruins. Agreed. One area piece of terrain. I pause. And three pieces of as-is hills. Yep, agreed. So, and the biggest thing is, guys, before you ever start putting anything on the board, make sure that you have already clarified with your opponent exactly what you're looking at so we're not looking at turns five six and seven bitch fest because of the fact that you think you're getting a two plus cover save and that's actually a hill so those are the biggest things you want to make sure you do so first off now we're going to roll for what would be sides but it doesn't matter at all <laughs> so greg won the roll so he places out the first fortifications if both of us had a, p a fortification now he has one which is the GS defense line. And no matter what fortifications or terrain you place there, guys, the big thing is, is that at Adepticon, your fortifications or pieces of terrain need to be five inches away from any board edge and five inches away from any other piece of terrain. So he's going to place his first piece of fortification down, make sure it's five inches away. Now the thing is, guys, is that this is your deployment. Don't just slap things on the board here because this is just like basically placing your first unit out. You should have a, reason, a rhyme and a reason why you're placing everything out here. So he's actually placing out. I'm measuring out. five inches from all of the board edge. And so now that the fortifications have been, it comes to me, I pass on fortifications. Now Greg won the roll, so he's getting the first piece of terrain to place. Okay. I'm taking this first piece here, uh, being that I'm Eldar and knowing Brad's style of list, I am uh, trying to give myself some place to hide for objectives later in the game. You can see I'm five inches away from the board edge and I'm also five inches away from the Aegeus defense line. Now I'd like to also get myself a nice tasty save for my dreadnoughts and have a place to hide later on in the game for when I have to take the objectives seeing as how the objectives today are going to be four objectives with a secondary of kill points. So I am going to take uh, this piece to again provide some blocking line of sight terrain. Greg just Maybe turned 14 behind. which is why his voice just broke a little bit <laughs> so uh can't help. Okay um actually going to put it out here. Now one of the things in the deployment orders is you can place a piece of terrain but it has to uh, partially in your opponent's deployment half but it has to be majority in your half. And you can see that I measured So basically there. you can place anything you want but it has to have more than 50 percent of it in your side of the table. Now seeing as how I feel that he's already blocked me off from this vicious quad cannon I'm going to go ahead and place five and five here, opening up a small window that I can move and fire through, setting up a corridor. I'm going to place another piece here, knowing that Brad would have to move through difficult terrain and trying to get to me. Now we've got one piece left, and I've got pretty open terrain, and I've got a couple pieces that are actually easy to kill. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and place this last piece, five and five, and taking it so that I hopefully cannot be seen the rest of the game if I shoot back underneath here. Now, once we've placed all fortifications and all terrain, you go to step number five, which is place primary objectives. I have my two objectives. I would, of course, have already lost my two objectives because we're on take seven right now, and I'm pretty sure I ate mine at one point in time. I actually stole them, and Brad, I will lend you mine, Thanks. seeing as I'm such a nice opponent. Now, Greg won the roll in the first place, so he continues to place first. Now, any objective marker has to be placed six inches away from a board edge and 12 inches away from any other objective. Now, seeing as how I know Greg's going to wear a skirt and probably hide from me the entire game, I'm going to go ahead and measure the 12 out. And I'm 12 out from his objective, but I'm also 
well six inches away from any board edge and I'm trying to keep it so that I can actually get myself a little bit of a cover save if I have to jump in there and take that one. And since I know Brad's army is going to be aggressive and try to come after me because they like to purge the alien, I am going to place my objective away from the other ones. Now I'm going to do the same thing because of the, the same tactic before. I'm also going to place mine right here in this middle of this piece of terrain just so in case I need to take some cover saves later in the game. So right now we've got for your five plus terminators or paladins. Yes. Good job. I've got fortifications place. We've got terrain place. We've got objectives place. Now we're going to go into step number six, which is warlord traits. Now in every one of your Adepticon packets, not pamphlets, you're going to be getting a little handout for each of these. This is warlord traits, psychic powers, mysterious objectives, and it will also have mysterious terrain on it. So Greg's going to go ahead and roll first because he won the roll. And yes. Eldrad's my warlord, so Eldrad will get what, a personal what's gonna, trait. What's he's going to do first, though, is never do that because yeah. it's one of my personal pet peeves, and I would punch him right in the throat because that's a douchebag maneuver. You declare what chart you're rolling on before you start throwing dice so you're not a homo and totally steal shit. Okay, <laughs> I am going to go with personal traits. Thank you, Brad, for correcting me on that. Six. You are a scoring unit. I am an immovable object. I'm going to have Drago roll mine. And Drago is also matching your feeble five foot two Eldar arm nonsense <laughs> with a real man in Terminator armor. After we choose warlord traits, make sure, guys, that you have assigned your warlords in the first place. Just like defining terrain, defining objectives, you need to make sure that you're writing all this down so there's not having shenanigans later in the game that make for an unfun game. Just keeping track of your own stuff. The person that's responsible for keeping track of all this is you, so make sure that you have it down first. So there's no reason not to have a super fun. You're playing with toys. So we're going to go into step seven, psychic powers. Greg goes first. I have Eldar powers. I could take the rulebook powers that are listed here, uh, but I'm actually going to choose to keep my Eldar powers. Okay. I have Kotiaz on my list, which he is a psychic level two, which means I'm going to get two rolls, and I'm going to take the divination chart. My first power is number one, I'm going to actually drop that for the Primaris power, which leaves me with accepting no matter what this die roll is, and of course I get yet another one. So I'm going to have the Primaris para and number one. Now, then we've, after we've determined psychic powers, and again I would write those down guys for your opponents also. I would go, the next fight is to determine whether or not it's night fight. Now on a four plus it's going to be night fight. If we don't get night fight on turn one, remember that turns five, six, and seven, if you do not is you have to roll again for night fight. If you successfully roll for night fight on turn five, it is night fight for the rest of the game. Now, again, that's another one of those things that's on you. So remember, if you're, you know, if you don't forget, well, it's too bad. You should have paid attention. And I'm rolling for our game. It's night fight for turn one. Okay. After we get night fight, we have deployment of forces, infiltrators, and scouts in that order. Now, we're going to be doing our full deployment today, but remember that placing your stuff then infiltrating, then scouting is the order that you're going to be placing everything out. Now as far as what we placed on today, we, we're not placing everything, but we did try to place in exactly the way that we're going to play this game, because we are going to end up playing this game out after we're done here. Now, I chose where I deployed to set up some firing lanes and to hide later on because I have a lot of squishy stuff, but I have a couple bad units that will pound out these little Eldar with a late game, hopefully just taking so, Greg, why did you place your stuff out here? I wanted to keep the Aegeus defense line almost as far back as I can because you're going to be coming at me and I need to, as long as I can, under, in cover, I place the objectives separated because I know he has one powerful unit that can go and basically take an, and hold an area. So I figured I would make him choose which area he wants to hold. Now, I also chose this because of the fact that I chose kind of an open area so that I could hide a few things later in the game for kill points if I was down, or even if I was up, I could just hide a few things. Now, this is our, what, seventh turn, throwing this on the board, and we're at, what, three minutes for each time putting out terrain? So guys, we're actually thinking about exactly why we're putting the terrain out, we're defining everything, and it's still really taking a very small portion of the game. So don't think that it's going to be really cutting into your game time and you're not going to be able to finish. I have no fear whatsoever that each and every game that I'm going to finish with, time to go up to the room and hang out at Adepticon this year. 
And that's with, I mean, and the thing is, is that your games are going to go faster if you're defining everything that you did in those top 10, those, that 10 lists, that 1 through 10. If you're defining terrain, writing down your warlord traits and your opponents, his psychic powers, you know exactly what everything is on the board, you're going to have a much faster game because there's not going to be arguments, there's not going to be anything, you have well-defined everything, and you're going to have a much better, much funner experience in each game. What do you guys feel the strengths of this method are versus the standard static TO place terrain? Well, we were talking about it before, and the thing is, is that, one, with static terrain, the problem is, is it's not really static terrain because people put their display boards out, smash everything to one side, and then you have the discussion about where you think things might have been. Also, the strength of this is, even though I couldn't stand it in the beginning, is that it actually is one more tactical step in the game. This is where your deployment starts. Because if you mess up placing terrain, it's just like placing a unit in the wrong side of the table or not being able to react. You know, this is where you should, right now, this is where the game just started. If you started placing things out poorly, well, you know, you should have maybe checked your strategy in the first place. The other advantage is when you both come to the table, you don't have to roll to determine who really goes to the other table half because the train's not really on the board. You don't have to take time to sit there, you roll, and spend five minutes, do I want this edge, well, do which I want is, this Which edge? is actually a big deal, though, for me, because of the fact that you look at Adepticon, that's one of the big things that won me over, is you get 30-plus feet of table. So if your opponent just randomly decides that he wants to make you move, you're in the middle of the team tournament, and there's 500 people in the hall. Now you got to pick all your stuff up, you know, wander around and hope that some jobber doesn't smash all your stuff on the way over. You know, you're just switch terrain out. It's a lot faster. I actually think placing terrain is faster than trying to move through the crowd and get your stuff going. You can have your terrain placed much quicker than you could have ever moved it or just even had the discussion of, you know, where, where should this that? have been? And, you know, you're in game three, four, you know, and there's been three or four dis display boards, you know what I mean, out there, people placing their stuff up. You have no idea where that originally was supposed to be. Well, and Brad, you had mentioned in one of the previous takes, for the, those people who are saying, well, I'll have a bastion. Somebody can just block my bastion in. Really, that's up to you. If you're, as long as you're playing smart, then no. You can, you're the only one really placing fully on your half of the table. And that's one of the concerns with people that people had with regards to fortifications. If you place a fortification down, kind of like I did with the Aegeus, there's no real way that Brad can really block it entirely to where I mean, it would he's be got, useless. I mean, he's got a full 24, almost full 24 inches of free zone, you know, and you only have to be five inches away from your board edge. It's just not getting blocked. If it's getting blocked, you're placing your stuff way too far up, or you're just not taking the proper terrain in the first place. I mean, it is tactically maneuvering around. There's not going to be enormous pieces that are going to block the entire board. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So, guys, if you have any questions on this method that you want, you know, uh, Greg and Brad to kind of come back through and answer, go ahead and leave it in the comments section. We'll go ahead and monitor it before Adepticon. If we have to make another video to clear up anything, we more than happy to. But this kind of gives you guys an idea of what the train setup really will be for Adepticon this year. Well, I uh, tell you what, I think uh, this kind of explains everything, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys here in about four weeks. And if anybody actually wants, I mean, if, any, if there's a lot of people that put comments for deployment, I mean, we'll go from that step and show how deployment infiltrators and scouts work if anybody really has any questions that aren't answered. And with that, guys, we will see you at Adepticon.